Good afternoon. Hi, how are you? Great, thank you. I am here today with Representative Bev McElroth, who represents the 196th Legislative District from York County, who has served the House between the years 2001 and 2008. Thank Thanks. you for being here with me today. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I wanted to begin by asking you about your childhood and your family life, and can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you feel those experiences shaped you to uh, be involved in public service? Actually, I grew up um, outside Washington, D.C., Silver Spring, Maryland, um, with my mom, dad, and I had three sisters. So, so one of four girls, I was the second. And went to a private school until I went to junior high school, and then went to public school. And my dad was a corporate attorney, antitrust specialist, but he also did a lot of work um, on projects and uh, did a lot of volunteer work. So really what, I've, what I learned was really from watching him. Uh, the other thing was he cared about people. That was probably the resounding message all through when I was growing up, you know, give back, give back, you need to care about others. And so that's really what I took with me. I actually left home at age 17, went to college, and after that uh, I had absolutely no idea really what I wanted to do. I had a degree in psychology and sociology. As you know, you can't do a whole lot with that. Um, but I started working in York County and uh, it really just led me to, you know, through all my work experiences to the point where running for office made sense. Well, did you come from a family of, that was involved in politics? No, they really weren't. Actually, my parents were Democrats. And so I grew up in a Democrat home in a very Democrat area. Uh, it wasn't, and it's interesting because the person, my predecessor for this position, he says that from the time he was a little boy, he knew he wanted to grow up and be a state representative, and now he's a U.S. congressman. And when I speak to groups, I always say to them, ever since I was little, I had no desires to ever get involved as an elected official. I wasn't interested. There was really nothing I wanted to do. For me, it was about public service, giving back. That was the message that I had, being part of your community. Um, and actually, no matter what perspective you come from, it, it can lead you to the same place. Well, how different was it growing up in, uh, as you said, a Democratic household and then coming to York County? Uh, well, you know what, it was interesting because even though they were Democrats, all they talked about was again the same message of giving back and what happened was I was an independent all through college. When I moved to York County and I guess it was, it was seven years after that when I really started to get a little, you know, get involved in politics and that was because I began working for our district attorney. Our district attorney, it's a Republican county, Republican district attorney and I started to really look at the differences between being a Republican, being a Democrat, um, the issues, especially criminal justice issues, law enforcement issues, and government involvement, how much government should be involved in people's lives. And that's when, for me, it was a very clear decision that I, I was a Republican and not a Democrat. But it was really after working in your county, and of course you take on you know, the values and, and the culture of that area. And I think that's what, that, what really did it. Before that, I, it just wasn't something that I was interested in. Uh, could you talk a little bit about some of the other um, areas that you were involved in before you came to the House of Representatives? Sure. I'd be happy to. Right out of college, um, I started kind of in social work. I started at the York County Blind Center very quickly, went to York County Children Youth Services as a caseworker and a supervisor. Uh, that's probably one of the experiences that I am one of the few that bring here to the House of Representatives. I have been in the, the worst homes um, that you can imagine. I've dealt with the worst situations that you can imagine. Um, so I've had opportunities to see things that a lot of people did not. It was interesting, but uh, I would tell you that when I worked at Children Youth, that was the most difficult job I ever had, including being a state representative. From there, I had the opportunity to go work in the district attorney's office. I developed a victim witness program, a child abuse unit, stop violence against women program, and a juvenile prosecution unit. Great experience. And also at that time, in my own community where I lived, I got on borough council. I was elected to borough council. And for me, I didn't see that as a political job. I saw it as a community service. I also then became mayor. 
mayor's responsibility is over law enforcement, a perfect fit working with the DA law enforcement. Also had the opportunity, I did some consulting for the Office of Attorney General here. And then one day I got a phone call, I've been up here lobbying a bill and I got a phone call from uh, G under Governor Ridge, his chief policy person for criminal justice. And she called and she said, I heard you testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee and I love what you said and we have a job for you. So I became the deputy director of the Governor's Community Partnership for Safe Children, dealing with violence committed both, both by and against youth. Great experience, gave me the opportunity to work with every department in state government. So here I was, I, I was a mayor still, had the local government, 17 years with the county, state uh, county government, and then I had the opportunity for two years to work in the Ridge administration at state government. So I, I just started to learn as much as I could about how it all works, how it fits together. Um, and that was, you know, just a tremendous experience. I then got a phone call and offered another job back in York as the executive director of what's called the Healthy York County Coalition. And that dealt with all quality of life issues. So here I've been dealing with children's issues and violence issues. And now I got to learn about education, quality of life, health care, um, environmental issues, the, the whole gamut in the private sector. And when this position opened up, it was an open seat. The, the person that had before me, our state senator, all our local reps, I had known them. They all came to me and said, Bev, you should run. You'd be great. We really want you. We need a woman. Um, this would be wonderful. And it, it took them about a year to convince me. And actually, we, they brought me up here, and leadership up here said, well, how do we make this happen? And I said, well, do I get all the committees I want? And they said, no, but you <laughs> will get them eventually, and we'll give you three. And they did. They followed through. They did exactly what they told me they would do. The other thing is they really had to prove to me how my being a state representative would actually make a difference because that was my biggest fear. I'm going to come up here, I'll get involved in the politics, and I'll forget about, or I won't be as involved in making real life changes for people. And they told me, no, you can. You know, the, I think the comment I heard was about 10% of the reps are focused on policy and the rest are on politics. But they bo both factions need each other in order to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And so I came up here and that's what I did. I focused on policy. And it has been extremely rewarding. Um, well, we're going to move into your campaign. Sure. Now. Um, can you talk, tell us a little bit about your first campaign? Yeah, sure. My first campaign, I was a nervous wreck. I knew nothing about campaigns, even though I had worked on several, but it was, I had no idea what to do. In fact, I spent uh, money that I would not have normally spent on a marketing firm to try to, um, to market myself. And I didn't like anything that they told me because, and that's my best advice for people, that's why I'm telling this story. I didn't like anything they told me because they wanted me to be somebody I wasn't. And I was really happy with who I was. So everything they did, I just turned it around and said, no, I can't do that, I can't do that. This is, this is who I am. But I spent a lot of money in the process. But it was also, it, you know, I wasn't used to the, uh, the negatives. Um, in the primary, I had two opponents. In the general, I had two opponents. And I just wasn't used to being under a magnifying glass. Um, it was interesting. The newspaper said to me, we thought after, after the election, I said, why did you treat me like that? And they said, well, we just thought you were too good to be true. So we figured there had to be something else out there. Rather than just recognizing, you know, maybe it is what it is kind of thing. So it was tough. They, used to, they tried to use against me that I had four kids. Um, and how could a mother possibly be in Harrisburg and be a state representative at the same time? Um, and other than that, they really didn't have anything except she's not going to be able to do it. She, you know, she won't be able to do that. So that's really, oh, I, I was a career politician. That was one that kept coming up because I had been the mayor of this small, tiny borough that I didn't even know who was a rep or, I mean, who was a Republican or who was a Democrat on council. So it was, it was an interesting experience. And again, it was, it got very negative. Um, you know, they, they would say things that weren't true and it was a frustrating time. But after that, I was fortunate the next election, I did have an opponent. One after that, 
I did. And this past time, when I decided not to run again, was the first time I didn't have an opponent. <laughs> but it got easier because I realized all I needed to do was be myself. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of it was, when you're first running for office, they give you a whole lot of sound bites. You know, if they're talking about education funding, say this is what, you know, the state should be providing 50%. Well, that's not even true. So as after the first time I learned the issues well enough that I didn't need to use the sound bites any longer. Uh, were people involved in your campaigns? Did your family get involved in your yes. campaigns? I, well, I'm very fortunate. I'm a very lucky person. I have a wonderful family and I have wonderful friends. And my friends and my family were there for me. Now my kids, my one son was at an age where he was very interested. He wanted to go to everything. He came to everything with me. My daughters were 16, 15 and 16. They had other things that they were more interested in than uh, this. Even though they did, they stuffed things, you know, they, they stuffed envelopes, they did work polls, uh, they came to election night kind of thing, but they weren't as involved as my, my one son. My other son was a little too young. Actually, my youngest son wanted to work for the U.S. congressman and not me because <laughs> uh, he thought that would be a lot more fun. But, yeah, and my husband, he was very involved. Uh, a lot, a lot, you know, he had to deal with a lot. Mm -hmm. He had, we were, you're out all the time. Every evening there's an event. Um, it's very hard for your family to hear people say things that just aren't true, don't ring totally true. That bothered them. But you know what? We got through it, and all of them were wonderful. My friends were poles. Uh, my friends became my team, and they had been there for me throughout the entire process, the, for the, the entire eight years. Mm -hmm. Well, how did it feel whenever you were first sworn in? That was really cool. It was, a, it was the neatest experience. Number one, anybody that has the opportunity to stand on the floor of the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania has got to, it's almost like you can't breathe for a moment because it is so beautiful and overwhelming and you truly realize what it means to represent your constituency here in Harrisburg. I mean, and that's just, I, I was in awe. I just stood there and I looked around, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. Um, so it was a wonderful day. It was a wonderful feeling. It was a it was an awesome feeling, but it was also uh, scary because you want to do a good job. You want to do the right things. Um, and you know what you're up against for the most part. Um, but it, it, it was scary. But I, you know, it just made, it made you feel very important, it made me feel very important. Could you talk a little bit about the people that you were representing? Could you tell me about the district? Sure, I'd be happy to. We have a wonderful district. I have probably. I guess everybody would say that, but the nicest people that, that are out there. But they care. That's the thing that you get. Um, they care. You know, I can't tell you how many people since I decided uh, not to run again and to take a different position have come in my office, have sent me notes, have called me, have everywhere I go come up and say thank you. Do you know how much that means? That means more to me than anything that these people went out of their way to just say thank you for the job that I did. Um, we have, my district is mostly Republican, but I have Republican and Democrat friends. I don't care who they are. I was elected to represent all of them. And I have been very lucky because they are wonderful people. So I, I, I'm not gonna miss them because I'm still gonna be there. And my job is still about public service. So, you know, they'll still be a big part of my life. There are a bunch of people that represent um, York County. Oh, yes. So could you tell me what specific area you cover? I have the area, it's west of York City, all the way to Hanover, and then all the north down to Dillsburg. So it's the Dover area, the West Manchester Township area, um, Paradise, Heidelberg, uh, Warrington Township, Wellsville, North Cadoras, Heidelberg, and Spring Hill Borough. In Jackson Township, I don't think I said that. So it's it's a big area, it really yeah. is. And uh, I am very fortunate because my colleagues from your county have also become my best friends. Um, we spend a lot of time together, and we try to do what's in the best interest of all of your county, so that I'm not out there advocating and fighting for my little piece. We advocate and we fight for everybody. And I could not have done anything that I was able to do without them.
it was truly a team. Well, we're going to get to them in okay. a second. Good. But I wanted to ask you, um, what specific issues did uh, your constituents bring to your attention? Everything. Okay. Um, everything <laughs> from sure. <laughs> roads issues, of course, transportation issues, to health care issues, education issues. The biggest problem that impacts our area is property taxes. Um, we want quality education, but because of an old funding formula, uh, we, our property taxes are at the point where many of our people, and they, they remain that way, unfortunately, um, could lose their homes, have lost their homes. Property taxes is huge. Um, so it's, it's the area, the economy, of course, is a huge issue right now. So much of what affects the entire state also affects us. Just a few of them are, we could prioritize more than the others. But we have all the same issues as the rest of the Commonwealth. And they've, they bring all those to our attention. Um, unfortunately, as the economy gets worse and we put freezes on employment, what happens is state government becomes less and less responsive to the needs of people. As state government becomes less responsive and you can't get a person on the phone, they rely more heavily on their state representatives. So no matter what the issue is, when you can't find a person to talk to, that's who you know, you know your state rep. I, it do, wouldn't have mattered if it's local issues, county issues, state issues, no matter what, you're probably, as a state representative, you are the person that's probably had the most contact with your constituency. I do breakfasts all the time. That was my favorite thing, to get people out, to listen, to talk. We do you know, all kinds of meetings just to bring people out and um, listen to their concerns. So they know who I am. And when there's an issue, they call me. So it doesn't matter what it is, I've heard about it. Mm -hmm. And my job, no matter what, whether it was a state issue or another issue, was to get them the help they needed. Well, you talked about the breakfast and uh, other ways that you reached mm -hmm. out. Did you have a district office? Yes. Oh, yes, you have to have a district office. People, And it was, it's a wonderful lo location. Um, people would stop in. It was great because it's right around the corner from the hospital annex. So people would go get blood, and then they'd come over, walk over, and talk with us. And uh, it's in, it was right in the center of the district the north end all the way to the west and uh, lots of people stopped in to see us every day. We were very fortunate. Well, great relationships. Do you have a newsletter? I uh, had a newsletter. Newsletter went out regularly. We never missed. I think we did twice a year the first year. Well, I think we did three. Um, but we also would do like a bulletin if something important happened. Used our website, uh, the breakfasts, whatever we could to get the information out. The other thing is and I don't go to the grocery store anymore um, just because I hate going to the grocery store. But I do, you know, I eat at local restaurants. I'm in the community. Uh, you go to events all the time, whether it be a library event or a veterans event. We had a lot of veterans events uh, just to maintain those contacts and that communication. I did a dunk tank one time. That wasn't fun. Well, it was, <laughs> but it wasn't. Luckily, it was a really hot day. It was my first time doing that fair, and they said, Oh, come on, come on, come on. And I was like, all right. So I did the dunk tank, and I won't do it again. Once is enough. But you know what? People remember that, and they remember who I am. Mm -hmm. So. Well, now I'd like to talk about your colleagues. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, whenever you first started, do you feel that anyone was able to be a mentor to you? Yes. They were all mentors in one way or the other. They were phen they're phenomenal. Your county is one of the most blessed areas in Pennsylvania. Frequently, I hear that the, the delegations, the county delegations, fight or they don't get along, or they may get along somewhat and they don't get along, say, with the Senate colleagues. Not the case in your county. Everybody worked as a team. Um, I just can't tell you how fortunate I was. Uh, Steve Nickel, who is also retiring, he, you know, he's one of the brains up here. And so when I would say to him, what do I need to do? He said to me, don't try to know it all because you never will. Focus on one or two issues that make sense to you, that you're good at, that you know about. Learn everything you can and then you'll be the go-to person. And I, I did, I took that advice. Ron Miller, who was my office mate, um, we shared a, one of the suites for a while. Uh, first off, I'm directionally challenged, so I couldn't have even found where I was going if it weren't for him. But he was always there for me. I, I used to 
constantly say, Ron, we need to talk about this issue. We need, because it was somebody to debate with, to, to discuss, so that we knew what we were talking about, and what we were doing, what was going to be the best thing. Stan Saylor, he now is one of our senior people, just phenomenal, always there for me. Answer my questions. Two of us probably fought, you know, as much as anything, but we were like brothers and sisters. And he says uh, that all the time, you know, she's like our little sister. Um, everybody, everybody, Keith Gillespie, who's on board now, Scott Perry, who's on board now, um, my, Senator Mike Wall. We just have a tremendous group, and I could not have done anything without them. Mm. Do you feel like you've been a mentor to any of these guys? Uh, you know what? I haven't a mentor. No, I, I don't see it that way. I think maybe, if anything, um, I brought energy. Um, I brought, I'm, I'm, I ask a lot of questions, and I talk a lot. And so I got them talking. You know, men are different than women. And so men sometimes don't communicate as well. And so I was kind of like the cheerleader and the, and the let's talk about this issue, let's talk about this issue, this issue. Let's, you know, how do we do this? How do we do that? Uh, we just were a great team. So I, I wasn't out there to be anybody's mentor as much as I've shared the, the advice to the, young, to the others that Steve Nichol, Stan Saylor, Ron Miller, all those guys shared with me. I've shared that in return. But uh, it's more like we're just a team, and we work as a team, and we all recognize each other's strengths and build on those. Well, during your tenure, what has your relationship been like with the, the uh, governor? Um, with the governor, the governor's office. There's the a, governor's office. Oh, okay, there because there is a difference. I really have. Only, I think I've been in two meetings with the governor. Um, he honestly wasn't real responsive. Uh, his office, on the other hand, I found to be different. When I have met with uh, his chief policy person on several occasions about issues, and I've always gotten a tremendous response. Um, most of his secretaries within his cabinet, Secretary of Welfare, Secretary of Health, um, especially Secretary of Welfare and the Secretary of Education and the Secretary of DCED, those are the three main ones. Anytime we've had a county issue, they have been willing to come down and work with us. They have turned things around, they followed through, and again, I've worked with all of them, but it's really been those three who have had a tremendous impact on some of our problems in your county. So they deserve the credit for that because, you know, I, I would hear them speak and say, well, we would do, we would do, and I, I said, okay, will you do for me and for your county? And I think Estelle Richmond has probably been down to your county 10 times, if not more than that, just to deal with issues that I've asked her to look at. So I have found his cabinet to be extremely responsive. On the other hand, I've really had very little communication with the governor. Okay. I, I had noticed you had several bills signed, too. Yeah, well, I wasn't invited to the bill signings. <laughs> I was at, uh, yeah, there were quite a few of my bills that went in, but yeah. I wasn't invited to the bill signings. Yeah. Is there a story behind that? No. I just think they forgot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's I sad. Just, yeah. I just think they didn't think about it. Um, it, that's a difference between, between, you know, being of a different party. Uh, actually, they did finally the biggest one, which was the education funding formula change that I worked on from day one. Um, I'm the one that got leadership to agree to the study that brought about where we are today with the new funding formula. They did call me about that one. That's the only one in all these years I had heard from them. And it was way up in another area, uh, and I couldn't. They called me the day before, and it just... It wasn't going to work. Um, it's just one of the things that happens. Okay. You know, that's the politics. Yeah. And I don't worry about the politics. Uh, I don't even know how much the governor, I mean, I know his office knows what my role was. But remember, under a different administration, it really takes saying, I don't need my name on that. I just want it to happen. We need to move with that. You know, it really takes working both sides of the aisle if you're going to get something accomplished, especially when you have administration of one party and you're of the other party. Mm -hmm. And that was more important to me than anything, getting things done. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you talked about the camaraderie between your York County mm -hmm. delegates. What was the camaraderie like in the House with just everybody else? You know, we've been through a tough time, and I think I have to mention that. It's, it's been very difficult. Uh, we've, some things have happened, which has not made us look so great in the public eye. I have to cough. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so that's been a little bit, you know, difficult. However, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel like I have a great relationship with all of them. Because every time I've had a need and I could justify it, and I've gone to leadership, they've always been responsive. So, and, and honestly, Democrat side as well. I've been able to do that. So I, I will miss the people in the House and the staff more than anything. Um, the people that do the everyday job, the committee, the people, the executive directors of the committees, the ones that you go to to get answers for your constituents, we are so fortunate to have such wonderful people. And I will miss them. Uh, unfortunately, I'll probably still use them <laughs> for their knowledge and expertise because they are so good. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, I, couldn't, I can't walk out of here. There's always going to be a few that you just didn't get close to. But the majority of them have been phenomenal. Well, can you t tell me a little bit about what it was like to be a freshman member and what, what it's like now that you're a seasoned veteran? What's the differences between, you know, what time can do for, for you? Well, seniority. For, <laughs> it's, when you get the seniority, you, you know, you, you get uh, people look at you differently. When you're a freshman, it's almost like you don't really know anything. As you uh, grow as a person and as a representative and as you feel more comfortable addressing issues, people respond. And so that's probably the biggest difference that I see. As a freshman, I was scared to death. You know, you're, you're thrust into this world that you don't know a whole lot about. Uh, the politics are huge. Uh, paperwork, oh my gosh. I used to go home and I had so many bills to read because I thought, you know, gotta read them all. I would have so many bills to read that I'd even, I, I switched from taking showers to taking baths so I could read in the bathtub. That's how much work there was. Well, see, now I learned you don't have to do that. You know, you, you go through, you know which ones are really going to go somewhere, which ones aren't going to go somewhere. And so you're more able to make good decisions and understand the process better. And it really does take time. And incoming freshmen, um, they've got a lot to learn. And they need to take the time to learn it and to get that team behind them and find their mentors. Yeah, I'm just thinking that we've had a huge turnover. We've had a huge turnover, huge. And it's, uh, it's not gonna be easy with that kind of a turnover. You know, everybody comes in and I, I'm still very idealistic. I see the good, I, I, I rarely can, it's hard for me to see the negatives. It's just not my personality. Um, and I think you have to come in there with that kind of an attitude. But you also, you know, I wanted the world right away. I wanted everything I want, you know, I wanted property taxes reduced and I wanted um, all these other things to have happen. It doesn't happen overnight, it takes time. And for me, I'm not a real patient person. That was probably one of the problems. You know, if I had to pick an area that I had a, a weakness to be a state rep, it's the patience piece. I'm not patient, I want things to happen and I want to have control over that. You don't have that. We're, we're structured much like, uh, you know, that representative form of government. We choose others to represent us. They cannot possibly represent every single one of our needs. So they do the best they can to do the compromise and represent that. Is that always what I would have liked to see? No, it isn't. And so because of that, you know, if, you, if you're impatient like me, it does make it more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, looking back, I know that everybody in, our, in the leadership roles, always tried to do what they thought was in the best interest of the, of the entire caucus. And they get a bad rap all the time. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. It, it's, I guess, you know, the buck stops at the top, and that's kind of why they do, but they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Well, since you've touched upon some of these other issues, um, you've served in the majority. Yes. And uh, then, yes. And in the minority. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And um, I would have been very disappointed if I had left and we went back in the majority because it's, it's such a difference. 
being in the majority, in the majority makes all the difference in the world. You set the agenda. Um, there are some critical issues that I believe need to be addressed. I do not believe that they're going to see the light of day for quite some time. You don't have the ability to affect the change and to affect um, the decision making when you're in the minority. It's the bottom line. You also can't set schedule. I like to know, I like to set my own schedule. I like to know where I'm going to be. Um, when somebody says, you know, can, I, can you do a speaking engagement at 7.30 at night? I'd like to be able to say yes and no, I'm going to get there when you're in the minority. You don't know anything. You don't know anything. So it, that's a frustrating thing for somebody like me. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we talked about um, coming to Harrisburg and deciding what committees you were going to mm -hmm. be a part of. So I'd like to um, ask you, I mean, you got all the committees you wanted. Yes, I did. So how do you pick a favorite? Because that's I my, can't. That's my question. If, huh? you're, if your question is picking a favorite between children, youth, um, aging, health and human services, uh, education, and judiciary, that's tough. Mm -hmm. Because they all deal with a lot of the same issues, believe it or not. And in my new role, I'm going to kind of be like that uh, umbrella over a lot of a lot of those issues. Uh, I loved judiciary. It, it, it was an exciting committee. So that definitely is one of my tops. Um, and I love education issues because I think that's the crux of it all. Um, making sure that our youth get the education they need. Plus, again, if you look at my constituency, property taxes, how we fund education, how we pay for education, all come under that. And uh, this last term, I was right now, I was the chairman of the subcommittee on basic ed, and so it was, you know, it was exciting to me. And I'm, I'm really, really going to miss it. Again, we were in the minority, and that does make a difference because we can't move our agenda and we can't set our agenda. But uh, all my committees were, you know, that's me. That's who I am. And it was perfect, perfect match for me. Well, it might be a hard question, too. Um, what was the most rewarding experiences that came out of your committee work? Well, believe it or not, the, the change to the education funding formula was huge. And I hope that can be sustained. Um, for our, my area, a growing area of Pennsylvania, one of, I believe, only seven counties with significant population growth, uh, we were getting less money per student than we got in 1991 because they took growth out of the funding formula. The only way we will ever reduce our property taxes is to change the funding formula first. We did that. That came out of a study that I was able to get our leadership to agree to. Um, it wasn't the most popular decision. It was the right decision. And uh, I'm very proud that we've gotten there because we now know what we need to do. Now, whether going forward that happens, I can't do anything about it. That's on somebody else. But we know what we need to do, and we know what the numbers look like. So I, that, that to me was extremely rewarding. Just being able to get that done. Megan's Law. I was at the table for all the Megan's Law discussions um, and all the changes that we made to Megan's Law. That was extremely rewarding. And we did it the right way because it wasn't about one person, put it, person putting out a piece of legislation and saying, okay, everybody co-sponsor and then, you know, trying to ram it through. It, that wasn't what it was like at all. It was really about a piece of legislation that we worked on as a team um, that we came together it was a subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee that we listened to everybody and that we crafted with everybody's input. So it was a great process and I'm thrilled to be there. Uh, there was an energy piece of legislation that affected one of my major companies. We got it through the last time, the last day that we were here, I guess a couple months ago, right before the election. Uh, that was big. I didn't know if it was going to go through. And uh, I had to go, that was one where I had to go talk to the governor's office, talk to the Senate, partner with the Senate. Uh, it actually came out of the Senate. Uh, Senator Mike Wall introduced it initially, then he rolled it into a different bill, came over here. We had to roll it back and forth into several, but we got it done. And I can tell you that my business leaders came up here for some of the discussion just to educate us. 
And when they walked out here, they said, there's no way. <laughs> That's never going to happen. But it did. It did. Mm -hmm. So those are probably the three that really uh, stand out. There were a lot more. Um, a lot of bills that I had put in other people's names so we could get it through because that's not the issue. It's not about your name being on something. It's about fixing the problem. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. I, I actually am leaving here feeling very good about what I've been able to do. Well, I'm going to ask you now, what were the biggest challenges? In biggest challenges? In the, committee. Mm -hmm. in the committees? In the committees. Well, be, when you move to the minority, that was a huge problem in the committees um, for me. Uh, there were times, and I won't mention names or committees, where I would raise my hand to ask a question and I wasn't called on. That's challenging. Um, I'm not used, I wasn't used to that. I wasn't even used to ever hearing that from anybody. Uh, and it wasn't just me that wasn't called on, just uh, members on the other side, our side, were called on. So that was, that was just wrong. Um, other challenges, it's just slow, slow, slow process. You know, and the other piece, when things get thrown in. In my new capacity, I now see, I've just found out about something. I thought it, we had taken it out in judiciary, found out before it came to the floor, it was stuck back in. It's creating major problems at the county level, and it should never have been in there. Um, so there's a lot of ki those kinds of things. But uh, for the most part, I, I, you know, I love my committees. I loved them. I was very lucky. Got on the ones I cared about, the ones I had passion for, the ones I um, thought I could contribute to. And uh, for the most part, you know, we've been able to do some good things. Well, now I'd like to move to your specific pieces of legislation. Okay. Okay. Sure. Well, during your freshman term in office, you were able to successfully sponsor two bills two. Right. Mm -hmm, that became law. The first one was House Bill 1028, which became Act 30 of 2001 and it amended the Pennsylvania Commission yes. on Crime and Delinquency Law. Would you explain how this law was amended and what the process I'd was? I'd be happy for? to. Um, under the Ridge administration, prevention of crime, prevention uh, well, of youth violence, uh, actually prevention of substance use, teen pregnancy, school dropout, delinquency and violence were a priority. Every time an administration changes, priorities change. When the priorities change, all the things you've been doing for years just go away. Billions of dollars are spent on programs that just disappear because a new administration comes in and changes priorities. The Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency um, were, had done, under the Ridge administration, some of the prevention stuff, but then they also were doing um, what they historically did and what they've always kind of their mission was which was um, more the reactive stuff like here's money you know put some put some police on the street here's money you know create this program or whatever that is um, for juvenile delinquency there are ways that we can prevent some of those problems but it was never part of their mission to look at prevention uh, we just we did that right before the end of the rigid that was Schweiker actually right under Schweiker um, in order to make sure that that became part of their mission. Because prevention has got to be part of the solution or we'll never get there. Mm -hmm. So that's what that did. The second bill was House Bill 846, mm -hmm. which became Act 95 of 2001 and would become known as the Long-Term Care Residents yes. and Employee Immunization Act. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Love act? to. Actually, this is a bill that uh, we, were, we were seeing um, a good bit of our senior population who were admitted to nursing homes and they weren't they weren't given flu shots pneumonia shots but they also weren't educated about them and they weren't making it available this was Pat Vance Senator Pat Vance's legislation as a representative when she was a representative and when I first came in she said let me help you let me give you a bill. You asked about a mentor, and I was thinking locally. I um, mean, Pat is local, but uh, and I've worked with her on many issues. But this is one she came to me very early on. I think even you know what? I think we talked even before I became a representative, and she said, "Do you want this? I'll walk you through it." So she taught me how to make that happen, how to make a bill become law, by using that bill. So that was, that was hers, that was her idea, that was a need that was identified, and she helped me 
um, to learn how to do it. So it was pretty neat. What a great story. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and she's a phenomenal woman, by the way. She, I think she does that. Anybody that is really could use somebody to walk them through the process, she did a great job for me with that. Would you like to talk about any of your other legislation? Um, well, again, the most important pieces were the education study. That was, that was critical, mm -hmm. um, which then led to the change in the funding formula. Both of those were, they don't have specific bill numbers because I had them rolled into the education budget for each of those years. That was 06 and then also uh, this past year, 08. So that's how I got those done. Megan's Law, that isn't under my name, but I was a critical piece of making that happen, and that's important. And again, there's a lot of other bills out there. I, couldn't even, I can't even think of them right now. It's not about the bills that you pass as a legislator. It's about making things happen any way you can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've never focused on bills that were in my name because they were in my name. That's just not how I thought about it. Well, I'd like to ask you about the, um, the smoking law that just went oh, into sure. to effect in September. Um, as a cancer survivor, yes. how do you feel about Pennsylvania's rule, and do you think that they went far enough? I would have gone for a total ban, and that's what I was really advocating for, um, which would mean that everybody, private clubs, uh, bars, taverns, restaurants, would all be treated the same. And that's really what my constituency said to me. If you've got to do it, treat us all the same so that, you know, they won't have the opportunity to have people go to their establishment versus our establishment, and it would be across the board. That's what I would have liked to see. Um, the bill became a compromise bill. That's how most of the things that you see happen. They are compromises. It's a start. It's better than what we had. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania, you wouldn't have thought on an issue like this where all of our surrounding states and many other states have passed legislation like this that it would have been so difficult, but it was. So I'm glad that we got where we are. This is the one, I'll tell you what, I got a, I got a threat when we were working on this through the, in the Health and Human Service Committee. Um, I used to have people, 50, 60 people a night call me. Oh, it was, it was pretty interesting. Wow. It was. A lot of angry people out there about it. I think we're saying that it's okay. And maybe that's what we need to do. You know, this was a step and then maybe we'll move the next step. Um, but, and there's, there's always gonna be people that say, you know, how can you say that secondhand smoke causes cancer, even though we know it does. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think the hardest issue you encountered as a representative was? The hardest issue? Um, I, you know, I, I'm focused on the property tax issue, and I really think that's it. We still haven't solved it. Um, I really believe it's the property tax issue. What kind of system would work and meet the needs of all of Pennsylvania? Um, there are more, even with the new funding formula, there are really more winner, more losers than winners. If you're a representative representing that one of those areas that has lost student population and you're a loser, are you going to vote for it? We were very fortunate to move just to get the funding formula changed. But the property tax piece remains the same. Now, if depending on where you live in PA, you may say, well, I get you know back this X amount of dollars from the gaming, and that's really helped my property taxes. In your county, it hasn't made a bit of difference. In fact, if anything, they've all continued to go up, mm -hmm. and they will continue to go up. That's probably the most frustrating issue out there um, for me because of where, because of my constituency base. Is there any legislation that you had hoped would have passed? Lots. You mean about that issue? <laughs> well, about any issue. Uh, about any issue. Yeah, and because some I wish hadn't passed, by the way. <laughs> um, oh yeah, there's plenty that I wish had not passed, and then there are, of course, bills out there that I thought would make things better, and that's in, in every respect. You know, that's in healthcare, energy, environmental stuff. I mean, you're always going to have things that you think are, are better for Pennsylvania and for your district than others. And uh, it's, the, you know, it's, it's based on how many votes they get. Mm hmm Well, that, I didn't even think of that, the flip side to oh, that. Yeah, yeah there's, there are quite a few pieces of legislation I wish I'd never seen the light of day, so. Um, 
What aspect of your job did you enjoy the most? What did I enjoy the most? Uh, the people. Yeah, the people. And I'm, I'm talking about my constituents and my colleagues and the staff and just getting to know everybody. Um, we're very lucky. We have wonderful, we have a lot of wonderful people. And having the opportunity to work with them um, it just has been phenomenal. And having the opportunity to serve the people in my district has really been phenomenal. Um, it, I guess it was two, three weeks ago, uh, I was asked to come to our senior center. And my whole community, I didn't know where I was going, and my whole community did it, honored me that day. And I, it was just, I was so overwhelmed, I, could, I can't tell you. Because it was our school, it was the school district, and it was the senior center, and it was a community center, and it was, um, it was seven municipalities that, that, you know, go into that area. And they all came, and you know, I they started reading off all the things I had done, and I was like, I, you don't think about that, you know, you don't think about as you're doing. Oh, you know, let's chalk up another one. You never think like that, and uh, all the seniors and our senior center, the average age is 85 and older, so that's the average age there, and they were all giving me a hug and saying thank you, and that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes, that's what made the difference for me, having the ability to do that for others. Mm -hmm. Well, what did you not like about your position? What did I not like? Well, um, the hours were tough uh, because I love my family and I love my friends and I love my dogs. I have dogs too. <laughs> and you know what, that, I want, I, I've always wanted to say my job is my job and I have a life because I think that makes for a healthy person. And this is not a, this is a 24 seven job. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't mind, you know, when people call me at my house or if they walk up, you know, my neighbors sometimes would walk up to talk to me about an issue, that doesn't bother me. Um, but if I was having dinner with my family and people came and sat with us because they had problems, that, w that got a little tough. Our hours up here now. We've changed some of the rules, but prior to that, you know, you could be up here to three, four o'clock in the morning, um, and then have to be back up by eight o'clock the next day. That's that. That was hard for me. That's not how I work. Uh, actually, I don't think very well during, you know, those hours either. So it wasn't. It just wasn't uh, the way it should be. People always say, "I understand." Oh, you have a family. I understand, but we want you to come, and you go, and then I'll never forget. Uh, as a freshman, Governor Tom Ridge said, he had a meeting with all of us and he said, don't forget about your family. And you can go to these events and you can say, I'm coming, I wanna, I'll say a few words, but I'm not gonna stay for dinner because I really need to get home. It doesn't work. I tried and people were like, why are you leaving? You shouldn't be leaving, you know, we need you to stay. And then you felt guilty. And for a person like me, I was like, oh, I better stay. Um, lots and lots of time away from your family and your friends. Mm -hmm. That was the toughest part for me. Um, I wanted to ask you, since um, you have told lots of people that you are a breast cancer survivor. Yes, yes. Um, how, do you feel that you're an advocate for for that now? And I've heard you speak. I've heard I've heard you speak before. So. Oh yeah. Uh, you know. I want to be an advocate because you know what? You, you almost have to if you go through that. You almost have to figure out a reason why it happened. Um, otherwise, it's, at least somebody like like me, I do. I kept thinking, you know, how could this be? Why would this happen to me? And then I realized that because I'm in a position that I have the opportunity to talk to people and people do listen. I have the opportunity to reach more people than, uh, than just the average person does. And so, yes, I do see that because I think that's got to be the reason I had to go through that whole year of chemotherapy and radiation and three surgeries and it was just um, an overwhelming time in my life. But I think it's made me a better person and it certainly has given me opportunities to educate women all ages about the need for preventive care and what they can avoid and prevent if they just do the right things. And so I want to be an advocate for that. Um, because if I don't share my lessons, you know, what good was it? Mm -hmm. Do you feel it was tough being a woman legislator? Um, do 
think it was tough being a woman legislature. You know, it's interesting because I've always worked, this is a man's world and it continues to be a man's world. And yet when I worked for the district attorney, that was a man's world too. And so I always felt very comfortable in that environment. Uh, some of my colleagues don't feel, my female colleagues don't feel that uh, the way I do about that. Uh, the hard part about being a woman is that your values are a bit different. Your values are family first, and there's not a lot of time to, to, to do that. You know, that, that the men frequently, it's about the job first. For me, it's about family first. So there, that was a little bit of a conflict at times be, with schedules. Um, but, you know, for me, it wasn't that, it, I, I like working with men. In fact, I like that sometimes more than working with women. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the guys I work with, um, even the, and the women I work with in the house are just wonderful people. I enjoyed every moment of it. Um, again, schedules, that's a big thing. Women like to work during the day, men like to work at night. You know, that just didn't cut it for me. I didn't want to be here at 10 and 11 at night. Um, I'm very big on don't procrastinate, get it done, and get it done now. Um, Men don't seem as concerned about that. So there's, I think it's just a difference in, in thinking. The other thing is there's a lot of things that I'm passionate about that uh, I, I don't think are on men's radar screen. And that's why you need diversity in the house. And you need diversity with your lawmakers because the only way you'll get everybody's perspective is, is to do that. I think I'm one of the few that have teenage kids and had teenage kids the entire time I was here. There are unique um, aspects of being a mom with teenage kids. And real quick, a, a funny story. Uh, one of the reps who have already retired, he sat two seats down from me for six years. And he's a very conservative rep, wonderful guy. But every day around 3, 3.30, my phone would ring, my cell, and I'd pick it up and I'd be on it. Then it would ring again, then it would ring again. And he'd be like, what the heck are you doing? And I said, that's my kids coming up from school. They got to report in. He's like, what? I said, yeah, that's, you know, I got four of them. They have to report in. And he said, well, my kids never called me. And I said, no, your wife, that's who they're calling. So, you know, who was it? He was like, oh, I never thought about that. But, you know, it also gave me the opportunity. I, I talked to that generation all the time. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues that affect them. And I would, you know, bring that up here. And it's a little frustrating because, you know, that those weren't their priorities. Mm -hmm. as much as they were mine. Well, whenever you think back, um, <clears throat> you know, on your experiences here, is there a story or anything that you think you, you would like to share? I would just like to encourage others um, to take a risk, and it is one, and run for office, as long as you're doing it for the right reasons. It's about serving the people. It's about wanting to make people's lives better. It's not about, you know, giving, it's about empowering. And uh, as long as you're, you're gonna be here for the right reason, then you, then you should go for it. I can't, I look back now and I don't regret one minute of the last eight years. In fact, I see myself as one of the most fortunate people ever because I've had the opportunity to learn so much and to work with some of the best and brightest people, you know, in the world, in my mind. And um, I, I just will have nothing but um, great memories and positive experiences to take away from here. If you had to list one, do you have one fondest memory? Oh, the, yeah, okay, yeah, there is one. One night we were here really, really late, and I don't, I think it was the gaming issue. And there was a lot of fighting back and forth and leadership was out. And there was a period of time we were due back, I think it was like seven o'clock and we're all sitting in caucus and leadership's in the other room and we're waiting, we're waiting. And finally somebody stood up and said, let's tell some stories, you know, let's, what, let's entertain ourselves, let's tell some stories. And each one got up and told something and these were people that, you know, have been here for 20, 30 years. And they started telling funny stories about each other. And 
it wasn't as much what they were saying as the feel that night in the room. Um, the feeling that of how fortunate we are that we're kind of like the special people that had this opportunity that nobody else, you know, people don't get. And it was one of the neatest experiences. And I don't think I'm ever going to forget that night because it was, it just meant so much to me. And, I, and you know, I didn't have any stories to tell then, um, but just listening, it was, it was pretty incredible. So that's one of my best memories. Well, can, can you tell me, you know, listening to your story today and knowing what I know about you already, um, you know, just taking all your issues that you've already, you know, amassed through your careers, tell me, you know, again, just how do you feel that you're going to be an effective person going into this next position? Well, your, my, your next my role. My new job is the executive director of York County's Human Services Department. Human Services uh, encompasses children and youth, mental health, mental retardation, drug and alcohol, aging, Veterans Affairs, and our Youth Development Center in York County. And going forward, um, first off, I've learned so much up here that I can take back with me. You know, I knew pieces of everything, but I didn't know the big picture before. I don't think I could have done that job eight years ago. Not like I can do it now. Um, it's really about bringing everybody t together, looking at issues from that holistic perspective, looking at families. You know, a lot of people in Harrisburg believe that as we start to talk about human services and, and they talk about welfare, you know, they're all, uh, these government give give programs, you know, we give to people. That's not what it's about. It's about empowering people. Um, it's about giving them the resources to be successful in life. And I think I know so much more about the bigger picture now than I knew then. Um, I've been able to walk in and say, this is where we. I think we need to go. This is how I think we need to go. I would never have known that before. Um, I also think that I've learned just so much about myself that I'm going to be a better manager. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the other good thing is I have all these resources <laughs> and I'm going to use them. <laughs> um, you know, if I, I mean, I, I've also learned that, you know, if, it, if it's an issue, you know, a lot of times you do business the way you've always done it. We don't have to. I've learned that from working with the secretaries. We don't have to. We can ask to do tough stuff. We can ask to think outside the box. Um, we can try to be innovative and creative and to use our dollars more wisely and more efficiently. Um, one way and one reason I've always been a Republican is because I am very, very fiscally conservative. Uh, so I'm going to continue that with my new job. I recognize that as revenues decline, as the, you know, if we continue with the economy, um, sluggishness that we've had, the dollars aren't going to be there. So how do we do more with less? And how do we make the most of our buck? And how do we make sure that what we're doing with our money is effective? And you know what? Each one of the, my colleagues up here, someday that's what they want to see. And then they'll make better decisions. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm taking a step back. The other thing is, uh, yeah, I'll be doing really, I, I think, I thought I could make a difference up here, and I think I did. I think I can make more of a difference at that level. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try it and we'll see. And then who knows what I'll do. How, how are you feeling as you're preparing to, to I'm leave sad. the general? Summer? Today's uh, today's probably not the best day to ask that. Uh, we just had a, uh, a caucus where they said goodbye and you know that's hard. Um, I am excited to take on a new challenge. I am sad to leave the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. I will for never, never forget my experiences or how this place has made me a better person, never. Um, and you know, even with, I, I probably should say this, there's been a lot of negatives. Um, and yeah, there's a reason for that and there, sh there should be. You're always gonna have people, no matter what the profession, no matter what, that are not doing the right things. But that is not the bulk of the people who work up here. Most of the people that work up here are doing a great job for their constituents and for the right reasons. So I think that's important that people know. Um, I'm going to miss everybody so much. I really will. Uh, my colleagues from York, they've, uh, they keep saying it. We'll never get rid of her. 
because I will I'll always be knocking on their door and talking to them and, and being a part of their lives because we've gone much, much further past being colleagues to being very close friends. And I'm not giving that up and I don't think they would either. So, uh, you know, I, I thank the people for le giving me this opportunity. And uh, I just, you know, I believe I've done what they brought, what they wanted me to do here. And I'm just uh, very thankful that I had the, the chance to do it. How would you like your tenure to be remembered? Um, as a great public servant, um, as the lady who changed the education funding formula, because for our area that's huge, um, and as somebody that was responsible and they could depend on, who had the in honesty, integrity, and uh, did it the right way. Do you think you'll remain active in politics? Probably not, um, because I have to be, I think I have to be very careful. Um, when you work for the county, you work for commissioners, two are of one party, one is of another. Uh, I've, I've always worked bipartisan, that's just who I am. I work with everybody um, and I want to continue that. It's not, at that level, it better, it shouldn't be about the politics. It's really about developing good, sound policy. It's about making the county work as efficiently and effectively as you can. That's not about politics. So I will still be involved with my colleagues, but on a different level. Well, this concludes my formal questions. I want to okay. thank you for, no, thank uh, you. for uh, conducting this interview with me. And uh, I always like to give the representatives the last word. So if there's anything you, in addition you'd like to, to share, you know, this is your opportunity. <laughs> I think I've said a lot, as I always do, but um, no, it's really just a thank you. You know, thank you to everybody that gave me the chance to do this because it's been a phenomenal experience, one of the best experiences anybody could ever have, and I see myself as one of the fortunate ones. So just thank you. Well, thank you.